The Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O God. Jesus said to the disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, but if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these because I am going to the Father." I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Good morning. morning. And it's been a long time, uh, but I have been here. Uh, at Reconciliation. I was here uh, in the fall of 2015, uh, and I don't remember exactly what the event was, but that was almost eight years ago, uh, right after I started in August of 2015. And then I was here again, I believe in January of 2016, when we had a, a conference event called a partners event, and, uh, and I preached uh, there. So uh, it's been a long time, and it's good to be back here uh, in this congregation, especially uh, coming out of a pandemic, and you have a new pastor, and we've been working on our uh, North Carolina Synod level through one of the things we do, which is help manage uh, call process, and you all uh, did such a wonderful job of working with that, and uh, I think um, I think Pastor Jeffrey was fortunate, and I think you all were fortunate um, uh, to, uh, to find that match, so thanks be to God. Also, just want to thank you in general for all the Uh, ministry that you do in this community, uh, for your worship life, for your care for each other, uh, for reaching out uh, in the community in so many ways. I mean, you all are the the bedrock, the the building block of what the church is. Uh, Synods and church-wide structures are kind of like this, but congregations are where it happens from week to week and from day to day. And so uh, there's no synod, there's no organization apart from what you all do. So you're the most uh, important thing. So again, uh, we thank you for that. We thank you for uh, time that you put into things, gifts that you share, uh, financial resources that you share in this community, and for the portions that you share for the larger church beyond that support some of the things that I do regularly and with my staff uh, on the synod level, which just means walking together, right? S-Y-N, little prefix, which means together or same, like synonym, syntax. Uh, the other Greek word is odos, like your odometer, right, that tells you how far you've gone. Odos means uh, travel or uh, uh, walking. or you know, So walking together is what synod means. Uh, together we can do all those things we couldn't do by ourselves as congregations, basically, like manage call processes and Uh, never happens here, but believe it or not, conflict sometimes is something that we're able to help with on a larger uh, level. Um, Things like candidacy, raising up people to be pastors and deacons and synod authorized ministers and lay preachers and all the different things so that congregations can have worship leaders. Uh, Not to mention some of the things going on right here in Wilmington that maybe you all have your hand in a bit 
Uh, the new uh, Trinity Landing facility that's over there, we have, uh, we have nine of those kinds of facilities across the state now. No congregation can do that by themselves, but we started Lutheran Services Carolinas, and now they're, oh my gracious, uh, you know, they're almost a $200 million entity now of social services and adoption agencies and refugee resettlement and senior living facilities, and uh, the refugee resettlement is a huge deal. Uh, I mentioned Trinity Landing, uh, but also there's a new campus ministry uh, sponsored by the North Carolina Synod that is ecumenical for UNC Wilmington, uh, which used to be housed uh, right across the street from UNC Wilmington at St. Matthew's, and um, St. Matthew's uh, has uh, punted on that and said, uh, somebody else do this, and, uh, uh, and so we're working together with Episcopalians and Methodists and, uh, uh, and uh, Presbyterians to put together a new uh, campus ministry for UNC Wilmington so that uh, those students and faculty can be ministered to. Um, another thing I want to lift up that's pertinent to you all that I think synod involvement could be helpful with uh, because of your location, um, and, you know, don't want to uh, jinx us for, for all of this, but uh, it's been a little while, relatively speaking, since we've had one of those big storms, as your windows depict here. Um, the rough ones, I mean, not the calm ones at the end with Jesus. But uh, we have a grant from the ELCA in the North and South Carolina Synods for um, a full-time Lutheran disaster preparedness person, not response after the fact, but preparedness. And we highly uh, encourage you to invite those staff people in, won't cost you a cent, uh, to help you review and go over what a disaster preparedness plan would be for you all uh, on all kinds of levels, which might certainly include a hurricane, but sadly, as we know even from the news this morning and last night, uh, something like a mass shooting event um, or a terrorist event or any other kind of uh, human-made in addition to uh, natural sort of disaster. So those are all things that we do along with things like Lenorine and world hunger and disaster response and so on and so forth. So I'll stop my word from our sponsor, but I just wanted to tell you about that and say thank you for all the ways that you all start that. So that's the commercial. Let's look at our text for today, and I'm a little bit daunted, I have to say, because I have preached on this text uh, more than I've preached on any other text in all of Scripture. Imagine Pastor Jeffrey might have, maybe 1 Corinthians 13 because of weddings, but this is by far the most commonly used Scripture passage at funerals, and uh, sadly, uh, though I've done a little over 400 weddings, uh, I've done... Uh, about the same number of funerals through the years, and I bet you at two-thirds of those, this has been the gospel text. So it's one of those things that we hear. It's couched, uh, you know, from a Bible study perspective. It's Jesus' farewell discourse, at least in his flesh, before the crucifixion. This is his last will and testament. These are his words. Um, He's telling his disciples, and in John's gospel, they kind of understand what's going to happen, unlike some of the other gospels, and, and they don't like it. They're asking all kinds of questions, uh, and Jesus is getting ready to go. So what does he want to say to them? And this is how it begins. Now, I want to dial it back to, and I'm going to give away my age here, the 1960s in my childhood home, Bert Bacharach was the man. Uh, a lot of you all appear that you may be of a generation that you might remember Bert. While the British invasion and Elvis and rock and roll and Motown were beginning to rule the airwaves, Bert's music was all the rage for my dad and in my house. You know, with hits like, what the world needs now is what? Is love, sweet love. You do know, what's it all about? Yeah, you know, just like me, they long to be close to you. I'll never fall in love again. You know that one. You'll never get to heaven if you break my heart. So many of those. Each morning I wake up before I put on my makeup. Let's say a little prayer for you. Yeah, isn't that great music? Yeah. 
My dad's favorite Burt song, though, was not something that ever made the top 40. I've been thinking about it, uh, actually, before I looked towards sermon prep this week, because yesterday would have been my dad's 92nd birthday had he lived, but we lost him six years ago. And honestly, again, I thought of my dad and so many loved ones that we've lost because just like hymns or other things, oh, we sang that at daddy's funeral, or we sang that at mama's funeral, or we read that at daddy's funeral. Um, They, you know, kind of evoke memories from us. And because we use these so often in funeral and remembering passages for comfort's sake. Anyway, dad's favorite Bacharach song was from a 1964 film of the same name. And maybe some of you saw it or listened to the song, but it was called A House Is Not A Home. Well, one reason maybe the song didn't top the charts was because Bert himself recorded it. And while an amazing composer and he could carry a tune, he didn't have the best voice uh, for solo performance. Um, but the, the House Is Not A Home song kind of went like this. See if you remember it. A room is not a house, and a house is not a home, when there's no one there to hold you tight, and no one there you can kiss goodnight. Anybody remember that one? Yeah. It was a great song, a romance song. I understand it was a romance song, but I, I remember, and this is getting to the point a bit, as a preteen, my father playing it over and over one Saturday morning on the stereo turntable, remember those, just before driving our family to Hudson, North Carolina, uh, between Lenore and Hickory, where he grew up as the youngest of eight children. The house where he grew up was about to be torn down to make way for the Baptist Church Family Life Center next door. Granddaddy Smith had donated that land for the Baptist Church. So after the five of us and my family visited the cemetery where my dad's parents, born 1884 and 1888, are buried, we walked across the street to that house. And for a few minutes on that front lawn, and for the first time that I ever noticed, my daddy left us. I mean, he was standing there but he was transported back to a time when the house was bustling with teachers who boarded there with family home for the holidays during World War II, not knowing for two of those Christmases whether my Uncle Ted and the South Pacific were alive or dead. With aromas of pies in the oven, always eight or 10 or 12 pies, always music, having had two sisters who won the state piano competition and a brother who had sung with Guy Lombardo's orchestra. My dad just stood there, transfixed, staring through the years, the relationships, the joys, the tragedy of two weeks before his high school graduation, finding his daddy face down behind the plow, dead of a heart attack. And for the first time, I saw my daddy cry, tears rolling. I tried, even as a youngster, to picture from stories he had told us and from pictures of my dad as a little boy, his running around that house in another time. And we all reverently followed him as he walked toward the house and picked up a souvenir loose brick to take home and put on his desk and headed back to the car. No words were spoken. After we had driven a bit, it was I who broke the silence. Sorry about your home, Dad. That's when he invoked Bacharach. That's not a home. That's just an old house now, he said. It's not home because nobody's there. Home isn't a place, son. It's wherever your family is, wherever love is. That's home. He wasn't implying that physical and geographical locations don't matter because, oh my, they do, right? I mean, they do. They they 
take us back, and they have memories. I'll always miss our house in Boone, where we lived for 18 years. I still drive by it every time I go up there. Um, our children mostly grew up there. Ruthie was only two when we moved there, and uh, the oldest, Matt, was in the second grade. They all graduated from high school there. And I drive by this house, and suddenly I'm flooded with memories of birthday parties and Christmas mornings and nights huddled next to the fireplace during a blizzard when the power went out, and prom nights and the oak tree my daughter and I planted that she named Sally when it was tiny, and now it towers over the roof of that house. Different children live there now. Dad was right, and so was Bert. A house is not a home without the relationships. In this farewell discourse, Jesus is trying to help the disciples and us make sense of this separation that, that is death. He promises, even within that, that he will be transformed, that he will be raised. But the disciples want none of it. We're status quo people, aren't we? I mean, we want to be able to grasp and predict and know, especially in these precious relationships, and especially one like with Jesus, when we left everything, Daddy sitting in the boat with all of his nets to try to somehow fend for himself because I've got this crazy idea that I'm going to follow this wandering rabbi for the next two or three years. Though Jesus promises the Holy Spirit as his transformed presence, they're having none of it. Why do you have to go? What do we do without you? We do not know the way. Quit saying that. Why does everything have to change? And in their distress, Jesus exhorts them, yes, with words, let not your hearts be troubled. Trust me. To me, though, that's not really complete and make me feel completely better. I mean, it's sort of like in every uh, argument you've ever been in and somebody's just really just in a tizzy and you say, calm down. You know, never in the history of calming down has anybody calmed down by being told to calm down. <laughs> calm down. Don't let your hearts be troubled. It's going to be fine. Trust me. But for Jesus, it's not so much about place. He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Yes, place is the word that is used, that implies geography, but then he very quickly defines that in a different way. So that where I am, you may be also. So amid all of life's challenges and crises, when the words fail us, what we need most profoundly is not answers, Though we want them, all the way back to the garden, all knowledge of good and evil, but presence, relationships, which is why, though it can seem perfunctory at times, that we gather intentionally always around word, always around sacrament that we share with each other, caring for each other in relational ways because that's what matters and that's what home is in the most secure and hopeful sense of the word that where I am you may be also different place same relationship Thomas the ever practical one I love Thomas says Lord how can we know the way Jesus tells him not a spatial thing at all but Jesus himself and then isn't it wonderful you're looking for the way I am the way <laughs> and the truth and the life. The relationship is where we find our home. Oh, my goodness, relationships are hard, especially amid culture wars politically and every other way that you can slice it denominationally. All these other things where it seems like the great energy is trying to make us afraid of each other and to pull us completely apart. But from the beginning, from the get-go in the Hebrew, Hebrew scriptures, it's all about relationship with God and with one another. And that is where we long to be in a hopeful and secure way. The relationship is where we find our home when the house is being torn down. 
our body, our hope, are empty and demolished. Robert Jensen, my systematic theology professor, way long ago, 40 years in seminary, defined heaven as the perfect reconciliation of all relationships with God, with self, with others, and with all creation. That's what we long for. That's where we're headed no matter what else it might look like. That's what we're promised. Here in John chapter 14, Jesus reminds us that strong as memory is, and I love memories, I can be nostalgic. Hmm. Already have been today, right? Hope is stronger still. That which I do not know and cannot grasp, but move forward in hope nevertheless, because I don't have to do it by myself because you're with me. It doesn't mean you agree with me, that you think like me, but we gotta figure out a way to be in this together or we're not in it. And God is with us in Christ, even and all the way to the grave. And in overcoming that grave promises us that ultimately we will all be together death behind us. Easter changes everything. It's into that hope and presence and life beyond death that we are baptized as God's precious children, claimed, forgiven, loved, and held. That house with many rooms in Christ's presence is home. I so want to go home. I need to go home. We all do. Amen.